Grogenbuck. I have the privilege today to chair another webinar of the EFLM. I'm a professor of molecular diagnostics and quality management at the Brandenburg University of Technology in Cottbus Senftenberg, Germany. And it is my privilege today to introduce Professor Giuseppe Lippi, who will give us a webinar on sepsis biomarkers. Giuseppe Lippi is a full professor of clinical biochemistry at the University Hospital of Verona. He's heading the laboratory there. Apart from this job, he is the secretary of the European Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine. <laughs> Giuseppe Lippi is a distinguished scholar. He has, he has published more than 1,500 articles and six books as well as 30 chapters. He has an incredible track record. His cumulative impact factor is 5,860 and he has an age index of 82. Giuseppe is uh, the editor-in-chief of the journal Annals of Translational Medicine and of the journal Laboratory and Precision Medicine. He is an associate editor of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine as well as of Seminar and thrombo um, Thrombosis and Hemostasis. Um, in addition to that, he is an associate editor of the journal Diagnosis. Well, Giuseppe has delivered more than 260 lectures at national and international meetings and he has received several awards. Among them, the American Association Clinical Chemistry Patient Safety Award in 2014 and the Outstanding Speaker Award in 2016. Giuseppe's main research interests are in the field of hemostasis, cardiovascular disease, pre-analytical variability, discovery and above all validation of diagnostic uh, biomarkers. Well, we are looking forward to Giuseppe's talk on sepsis biomarkers today. Giuseppe, the floor is over to you. Thank you, Dirk. It is my very pleasure to speak on this new FLM webinar on sepsis diagnostics. I'm willing to split my talk in two parts. The format is mostly aimed at providing some recent updates on sepsis definition, epidemiology, and clinical outcomes, while the latter will be more focused on past, present, and hopefully future diagnostic tools. Before beginning my talk, however, I would like to thank once more Daniel Radil for the outstanding work he is doing to run the FLM webinars, and to my good friend, Professor Dick Roggenbuck, for chairing this webinar on sepsis diagnostics. To get started, the first important aspect that needs to be clarified is the current definition of sepsis, which more or less, like the universal definition of myocardial infarction, has gone through many changes in recent years. According to the sepsis tree, which is supposed to be the least, but perhaps not the last definition, sepsis is defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a deregulated host response to infection, while septic shock is instead now basically regarded as a specific subset of sepsis where the many circulatory and cellular or metabolic abnormalities in response to an infection produce a remarkable higher risk of mortality. The first part of the definition is especially important because unlike how sepsis has been earlier defined, the sepsis tree panel has now definitely established that the detrimental biological effects of sepsis are not directly caused by the infectious agent by itself, whatever it could be, but rather by a highly pathological response of our organism to that infection. This important enlightenment leads the way to a first important conclusion. Identifying a blood-borne pathogen is not synonymous for sepsis, and on the other hand, the inability to detect a blood-borne pathogen with the current diagnostic methods does not rule out a diagnosis of sepsis. I will later show you how this paradigm shift in the way we have thought of sepsis for decades 
may contextually revolutionize the diagnostic approach. Some brief updates on sepsis epidemiology and consequences on this slide. Basically, sepsis is the leading cause of death from infection, especially when not timely recognized and treated, and can now be unquestionably considered a major public healthcare issue, which accounts for over $20,000 billion in the US, and such huge amount of money accounts for nearly 5.2% of the total hospital costs in the United States. Putting these figures into real numbers, it is hence not surprising that the current statistics attest that each year at least 1.7 million people will develop sepsis in the US, 270,000 of whom will then die for this condition. Overall, and this is even more impressive, one out of three patients who die within a healthcare facility will die for sepsis. To further emphasize the clinical and economical burden of sepsis, the trend of sepsis cases is shown in the lower part of this slide, where it can be clearly seen that the estimated cases of sepsis will rise by approximately 60% in the next 30 years, with an increase that is much more pronounced, nearly double, than the increase of resident U.S. population over that same period. As earlier mentioned, when we have discussed the new definition of sepsis, this condition is mostly caused by a deregulated host response to an infection. The leading infectious agent that may cause sepsis are briefly summarized in this table. Overall, bacterial sepsis accounts for the vast majority of cases, with gram-negative bacteria being the most frequent microorganisms detected in patients with sepsis. Among these, the most frequent bacterial species are Pseudomonas, followed by Escherichia coli and Klebsiella. Regarding gram-positive bacteria, Staphylococcus aureus is the most frequent species. I would also bring your attention to fungus sepsis, since fungi, especially candida overall, and Aspergillus and Cryptococcus in immunocompromised patients may be responsible for up to 20% of cases. This important aspect deserves a specific focus, so that I will shortly discuss the diagnostic of fungal sepsis toward the end of this webinar. Taking a step forward toward sepsis diagnostics, the foremost concept that we should first take for granted and also clearly highlighted in this slide of the World Sepsis Alliance, to which the FLM is an active partner, is that time is always critical in sepsis. It is then not worthy that the conventional word time can be straightforwardly converted into an acronym containing the leading diagnostic criteria for sepsis, where T stands for temperature higher or lower than normal, E for potential signs and symptoms of infection, M for mental decline, and E for extreme illness. So why time is critical in sepsi, probably even more than for any other human disease, simply because there is a direct relationship between the diagnostic delay and the risk of adverse consequences, which are then represented by organ injury involving virtually any organ and tissue, such as lungs, kidneys, brain, adrenal glands, and so forth, up to the most severe progression toward the so-called MOF, which stands for multi-organ failure and underlines the widespread impairment of all bodily organs and tissues. Needless to say that in the vast majority of cases, MOF is a point of no return, which is almost inevitably followed by death. The most characteristic signs and symptoms of sepsis are shown in this slide. This typical entail, as mentioned, higher or lower than normal temperature, tachycardia, meaning a heart rate higher than 19 beats per minute, which is often accompanied by tachypnea, meaning a respiratory frequency higher than 20 respiratory acts per minute, and either leukocytosis or leukopenia, meaning a white blood cell count higher than 12,000 leukocytes per milliliter or lower than 4,000 leukocytes per milliliter. Additional criteria are then necessary for defining the onset of septic shock, which is typically diagnosed in the presence of severe hypotension. Finally, multi-organ failure is diagnosed in the presence of functional impairment of more than two bodily organs. The sepsis 3 definition has also set some essential criteria for establishing the prognosis of sepsis patients. As you will see in this slide, these entail arterial oxygenation, arterial pressure, mental state, and importantly, the results of three basic laboratory tests, namely a progressive, a progressive decrease in number of platelets, 
a gradual increase in total bilirubin value and a progressive increase of serum creatinine as a hallmark of renal failure. All these parameters are included into a clinical score, which is conventionally defined the sequential or sepsis-related organ failure assessment score, abbreviated as SOFA. A simplified SOFA score, conventionally defined quick SOFA score, has been developed for use outside the intensive, intensive care unit, basically in emergency department, which only entails respiratory rate, arterial blood pressure, and mental status. Most importantly, as also clearly related by the sepsis 3 panel, both the SOFA and the quick SOFA score are only intended to be used as mortality predictor and not a score for diagnosing sepsis. This is also clearly reflected in the huge number of published articles which have explored the diagnostic efficiency of both scores for diagnosing sepsis. Assuming that you will be familiar with the concept of rock curves, in this study, for example, the area under the curve of the quick SOFA score was found to be very modestly useful for diagnosing sepsis in the emergency department, displaying an overall diagnostic efficiency of 73%, but especially compounded by a dramatically low diagnostic sensitivity, lower than 30%. Similar findings were published in another study very recently, which also showed that the efficiency of both the SOFA and quick SOFA score were far below 75%. This ultimately confirms the basic assumption that both the SOFA and quick SOFA score are not diagnostic tools but they are rather should be used as a sort of red flag during the triage of patients, since they only allow to identify a subset of patients at higher risk of developing several complications, especially death. Given thus for granted that signs, symptoms, and basic laboratory tests are of very modest utility for diagnosing sepsis, what other laboratory approaches can we use for diagnosing this condition? In the following part of this webinar, I will then try to give some updated insights on some potentially useful diagnostic biomarkers, which basically include all and well-known tests, such as erythrocyte sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein, and other emerging biomarkers, such as procalcitonin and presepsin, also presenting data on the diagnostic efficiency compared. One of the most reliable definitions of diagnostic diagnostic biomarkers that you can find in the current scientific literature is that given by my good friend Philip Schutz, who points out that a reliable biomarker shall be a laboratory test aimed at improving clinical problem solving in routine care. Translating the informal concept into sepsis diagnostic, the ideal characteristics of a sepsis biomarker and compass, being present at symptom onset or possibly even earlier, to allow an early diagnosis being highly sensitive and specific for infections, to allow an accurate differential diagnosis between infectious and non-infectious diseases, being capable of identifying the microorganism which has caused the infection, providing valuable clinical information on the clinical cause of sepsis, and so providing also clinical useful information on the prognosis, and possibly guiding therapeutic decision which is actually reflected in patients with sepsis by allowing an efficient antimicrobial stewardship. Before presenting some updated data on sepsis biomarkers, I would like once more to stress the importance of the new sepsis-3 definitions, which poses at the center of the clinical reasoning not the infection per se, but rather the non-homeostatic host response to that infection. According to this paradigm shift, the main consequence is that the assessment of biomarkers which can reflect the disproportionate non-homeostatic host response would hence appear more efficient for initial screening of patients with suspected sepsis compared to the direct, the direct isolation or identification of microorganisms from blood. Even more importantly, the revolutionized concept underscores the essential aspect that sepsis can also occur in patients with severe but localized infection, even before the microorganisms have massively entered the bloodstream. This actually translates into the paradigm that a positive blood culture shall no longer be considered a synonymous for sepsis. We can have sepsis so even in patients with negative blood culture for a variety of biological, preanalytical, and analytical issues, such as the low amount of microorganisms into the circulation, 
frequently intermittent nature of bacteriemia or fungemia, the fact that sepsis can also be triggered by unusual or unknown microorganisms whose identification may be challenging in routine laboratory practice, along with an ongoing antimicrobial therapy which may ultimately inhibit bacterial or fungal growth. It is important to mention here that blood cultures are also plagued by other well-known drawbacks, such as long turnaround time, low sensitivity, large sample volume, and frequent need for repeated testing to increase the diagnostic. Therefore, going through the current armamentarium of sepsis biomarkers, we can actually divide them into some arbitrary categories, mainly as past, current, and future, future biomarkers. <coughs> Sorry. The two historical, mostly known tests for diagnosing sepsis have been for long erythrocyte sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein. Both have important shortcomings, as highlighted in this slide. This typically entail a rather delayed kinetics in response to an infection, which does not allow an early diagnosis of sepsis, and especially the very poor diagnostic specificity. Seeing both the SCR and the CRP, are very frequently elevated in a vast array of non-infectious conditions. Protacetonin is the 116 amino acid precursor of the active hormone calcitonin, which is normally produced by the CALS1 gene in thyroid C cells. Under physiological conditions, the circulating procalcitonin concentration is very low, virtually undetectable with many immunoassays. However, many inflammatory stimuli, including bacterial infection, can cause a sustained ectopic, virtually ubiquitous production of this protein or hormone, as you want to call it. The target organs most responsible for this ectopic production include the liver, the lungs, the kidneys, the pancreas, the heart, the brain, which all contribute to increase the circulating concentration by several orders of magnitude, from less than 0.05 up to 10 100 nanograms per milliliter. This metabolically abnormal response to pro-inflammatory triggers represents the basic underlying assumption which justifies the measurement of procalcitonin in patients with severe bacterial infections. There is now consolidated evidence that the synthesis of procalcitonin is not only triggered by bacterial products such as endotoxin, but also by some pro-inflammatory and um, active cytokines such as such as tumor nucleases factor alpha, interleukin 1 beta, and interleukin 6, irrespective of the presence of a localized or systemic bacterial infection. These properties would actually make procalcitonin a virtually incomparable biomarker in patients with sepsis, since increased concentrations may be actually triggered by a dual mechanism involving both direct and indirect infectious pathways. Regarding its kinetics following bacterial infection, procalcitonin concentration in serum or plasma begins to increase within 2-4 hours, reaches the peak at around 12-24 hours, persists as long as the inflammatory process continues, which can be for days or weeks, and finally normalize when the infection is eradicated. It is indeed interesting to note that the first article on the use of procalcitonin for diagnosing sepsis was published by Asicot and companies in the journal Lancet in the 1993. After 26 years, the number of PubMed articles that can be identified using the keywords procalcitonin and sepsis has exponentially grown, thus confirming that the current available evidence shall be considered solid and trustworthy. I will hence review some of the most important data published on this biomarker in the next part of this webinar, trying also to compare the diagnostic performance of procalcitonin with that of other sepsis biomarkers. In this slide, I will then show you some, some study which have attempted to demonstrate the clinical uselessness of measuring procalcitonin for sepsis diagnostic. I am particularly eager to present the results of this study which was published more than 15 years ago in my hospital, and according to which you will clearly see how procalcitonin measurement consistently outperforms C-reactive protein for diagnosis in either localized or systemic infection. The first meta-analysis was then published in 2004, showing that the pool sensitivity 
and specificity of procalcitonin were much better than those of, again, C-reactive protein. Another meta-analysis was published two years later, also showing that the diagnostic performance of procalcitonin was much better than that of C-reactive protein. Importantly, both the pool sensitivity and specificity of procalcitonin, as you will show in the lower part of this slide, were much better than those of C-reactive protein. Interesting data were then published in the forthcoming years, pointing out that procalcitonin concentration was highly correlated with bacterial load, severity of infection, and clinical outcomes. One important aspect in procalcitonin measurement is that its concentration is, longly, is strongly dependent on the bacterial species responsible for the infection with gram-negative bacterial sepsis being associated with a much higher value than gram-positive bacterial sepsis. We then confirmed this finding in another study, where we demonstrated that procalcitonin concentration is substantially dependent on the bacterial species responsible for the infection across a broad range of bacterial species. Change is topping. Presepsin, which was formerly known as soluble CD14 subtype, is a glycoprotein expressed on the surface of the myelomonocytic cells and which is strongly released into circulation after binding with lipopolysaccharide, peptidoglycan, and other microorganism surface molecules. The measurable concentration into the circulation will enhance reflect activation of monocyte and macrophages occurring regardless of a bloodstream infection such as in patients with different forms of systemic inflammation. Like procalcitonin, procepsin's elevation in blood would so reflect both a direct effect of blood-borne pathogens, as well as the host response to the microorganism. Regardless of procepsin biology, the normal value in healthy adults is usually lower than 320 picogram milliliter. In elderly patients or in those with impaired renal function, Persepsin value increase. Globally, persepsin values in sepsis seems increase even earlier than those of procalcitonin, typically within one to three hours after the onset, the onset of the infection. The molecules also display a shorter half-life of approximately four to eight hours. Importantly, persepsin values declines after a few hours in sepsis survivors, while it persists elevated in those who will die. As for procalcitonin, I will show you now data published in some recent meta-analysis supporting the diagnostic value of these biomarkers in sepsis. In this first meta-analysis published in 2015, the diagnostic efficiency was globally comprised between 70 and 100 percent, with sensitivity often higher than 80 percent. In another more recent meta-analysis published last year in PLOS One, the overall diagnostic efficiency of persepsin was found to be as high as 89%. Yet, an important take-home message was contained in this article, referring to the fact that although the diagnostic performance is indeed excellent, this biomarker, likewise all other sepsis biomarkers, cannot be used alone for diagnosing sepsis. In this third meta-analysis, all the most important biomarkers of sepsis have been compared. As you can clearly see, the diagnostic performance of both procalcitonin and persepsin are the highest overall, comprised between 85 and 88 percent. Interestingly, persepsin also exhibited the highest overall sensitivity for diagnosing sepsis, second only to the flow cytometry assessment of CD74, which is obviously a much less technical and practical approach for urgent diagnostics of sepsis. In this other multicenter prospective study, the diagnostic efficiency of procalcitonin and persepsin were also found to be mostly equivalent, both considerably outperforming that of interleukin-6. Similar findings were published in this recent study, where the diagnostic performance of both procalcitonin and persepsin were also found to be mostly equivalent, but outperforming that of both C-reactive protein and proadrenomedulin. 
Again, in another study, the diagnostic efficiency of procalcitonin and percepsin were found to be largely better than that of C-reactive proteins. Overall, this last meta-analysis confirms that the global diagnostic performance of percepsin for diagnosing sepsis was as high as 90%. You can hence easily understand that the measurement of either procalcitonin or percepsin will have much more value to the clinical reasoning compared with both the SOFA and quick SOFA score, whose suboptimal performance we have earlier discussed. One important aspect that has been early highlighted on the clinical usefulness of sepsis biomarkers is that a given laboratory test not only should be useful for the diagnosis, but also for the managed care of septic patients. We are already familiar with this concept. Time is critical in sepsis. The longer is the delay before establishing an appropriate antimicrobial treatment, the worse is the clinical outcome, especially in terms of short and medium term mortality. Antimicrobial resistance has now become a worldwide healthcare issue, as recently emphasized by the World Health Organization which also highlighted the concept that misuse or overuse of antimicrobials is accelerating this process. Therefore, every potential intervention aimed at reducing inappropriate usage of antimicrobials without arming patients should be considered an unavoidable step forward toward reducing the burden of drug-resistant microorganisms. Along this line, the efficiency and safety of procalcitonin-guided antibiotic therapy has been recently demonstrated. For example, in this interesting study, procalcitonin-guided antibiotic therapy was effective to reduce antibiotic exposure from 13 to 5 days. This data was then confirmed in many following investigations, such as that presented in this slide, and according to which the authors could finally conclude that procalcitonin-guided antibiotic therapy was effective to reduce total duration of antibiotic treatment by over 4 days. Also in the large multicenter prospective pro-real study, a procalcitonin-based algorithm for antibiotic administration was found to be effective to reduce antibiotic therapy duration by approximately three days. Overall, as recently highlighted by Philip Schultz, the efficacy and safety of procalcitonin-guided antibiotic therapy for de-escalating antibiotics has been demonstrated in over 14 randomized controlled trials and across many different clinical settings. One conclusive aspect of procalcitonin-guided antibiotic therapy, which is often even more appreciated by hospital administrators and policymakers, is that this approach not only saves lives, helps reducing the potential burden of antimicrobial resistance, but also carries many substantial economical benefits for the healthcare system by significantly reducing the global expenditure for managing sepsis, as clearly highlighted in this large U.S. National Healthcare System survey. Taken together, the current evidence supporting procalcitonin-guided antibiotic therapy in sepsis have also been translated into a vast clinical setting, which, which would allow to conclude that in patients with community-acquired pneumonia, for example, not fulfilling criterion for sepsis or septic shock, Procalcitonin could be used to support starting antibiotic treatment. In patients with acute exacerbation of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, procalcitonin could be useful in the diagnosis of bacteria superinfection. In patients with community acquired pneumonia, not fulfilling criterion for sepsis or septic shock, procalcitonin could be used as a prognostic biomarker of worse outcome. In non critical ill patients, a procalcitonin increase after 48 hours of antibiotic therapy must not justify antimicrobial treatment escalation. Finally, procalcitonin value should be monitored over time to guide treatment discontinuation. In line with this consensus statement, joint recommendations have also been recently published by the Italian Society of Clinical Biochemistry and the Italian Academy of Emergency Medicine and Care. These recommendations were actually based on a critical literature review, as shown in this slide, which has allowed to identify the most important articles on these topics, with the aim to provide a critical overview of current evidence and some tentative recommendation to broaden the clinical practice application of procalcitonin and other sepsis biomarkers.
The first important conclusion that we made is that once more, procalcitonin and persepsin seem the most efficient diagnostic biomarkers for sepsis, with diagnostic efficiency globally comprised between 78 and 100 percent. Notably, the diagnostic sensitivity of this biomarker seeming offset that of other potential tests, while being characterized by a cumulatively acceptable specificity. Regarding their kinetics, you can clearly see that this seems more efficient than that of C-reactive protein for both early diagnosis and timely longitudinal monitoring of patients with sepsis. This is clearly confirmed by the fact that when both procalcitonin and persepsin have reached their peak concentration in sepsis, the values of C-reactive protein may still be within the normal reference value in the vast majority of such patients. We hence produce a number of practical recommendations for using sepsis biomarkers in clinical practice that are summarized in this table. Although a more thorough discussion shall be omitted in this webinar for time limitations, the article is open access and can hence be freely downloaded from the journal website, in case you may, you may be interested in it. However, I would just focus your attention on the fact that we have introduced the concept that either procalcitonin or prosepsis, prosepsin, or even a combination of the two, <coughs> sorry, of the two biomarkers, as then further explained at the end of this webinar, may be reliably used as screening tests for sepsis, always in combination with the clinics, of course. We have also put forward the concept that antimicrobial treatment shall be guided by procalcitonin values. Finally, we have emphasized the, the issue that the test request shall be in agreement with procalcitonin kinetics in blood. To put it simply, these tests should be not ordered after a too narrow period after the former requests, nor it should be ordered after days from the first prescription. Interestingly, this approach has been endorsed by many other international scientific organizations. In this slide, for example, it can be seen how the diagnostic algorithm of the NICE has also introduced procalcitonin as first-line test for the screening of patients with suspected sepsis. The following steps of the flowchart and that defined according to the initially measured concentration of this biomarker thus further emphasizing the central law of sepsis biomarkers. So, after having gone through this hopefully comprehensive tour around the past and the present of sepsis diagnostics, some clues on the future. Indeed, many recent technological advances have made it possible to consistently broaden the clinical usefulness of molecular biology with many relatively rapid and accurate techniques becoming available in both laboratory and clinical practice for macrobiological testing, as shown in this slide. Despite the direct identification of nucleic acids in the circulation would be seen as a very accurate strategy for diagnosing bloodstream infection, there are, however, some well-known drawbacks. One of the main issues is the still long turnaround time of molecular biology compared to measuring procalcitonin and perception, which, which takes from 20 to 14 minutes, and which would not allow concluding that molecular biology is really ready for prime time as a reference technique for early diagnosing sepsis. This assumption is also confirmed by evidence that the diagnostic performance of these techniques for detecting both bacterial and fungal sepsis remains still typically comprised between 50 and 9 percent, and largely dependent on many biological, clinical, and technical factor, factors, as clearly shown in this slide. Additional drawbacks of molecular biology techniques include the need of dedicated and often expensive instrumentation, high sensitivity of the technique used for lysis and nucleic acid extraction, vulnerability to ambient contaminations, possible generation of false positive test results due to deep-seated infections, doubts on the optimal sample matrix, interference from host nucleic acid and additional substances, amplification bias, off-target interaction, as well as to the current limitation and insufficient standardization of the test panels. So once more, we can conclude that the rest molecular biology techniques show premises, but it is too early to conclude that they can replace blood. Summary, the leading advantages and limitations of the currently available tests for diagnosing bacterial sepsis are summarized in this slide. Basically, 
blood culture, when positive, will allow an etiological diagnosis of sepsis, as an acceptable degree of standardization, provides a valuable clue on antibiotic resistance, but is plagued by a long turnaround time, suboptimal accuracy, and not, does not provide information on clinical outcome, and is also uh, extremely vulnerable to many pre-analytical drawbacks, such as, for example, contamination and positivity for commensal infections. On the other end, sepsis biomarkers, such as procalcitonin and presepsin, would allow an early and accurate rule-out of sepsis, regardless of its cause, will provide information on clinical outcomes and are not plugged by many preanalytical drawbacks, such as blood culture and molecular biology. However, they still have a low degree of standardization and do not provide definitive information on Similar conclusion can be made for the current armamentarium for diagnosing fungal sepsis, as summarized in this slide which basically refer to the use of presepsin because the concentration of procalcitonin can be normal or only slightly increased over the upper limit of the reference range in a very large number of patients with fungal sepsis. Regarding viral sepsis, what can be concluded from the current available evidence is that the diagnosis remains typically one of exclusion, no standard approaches to viral diagnostic testing are currently available, Cell culture remains the gold standard technique. Commercial or laboratory developed nucleate acid amplification tests show good sensitivity and specificity, but need sophisticated equipment and trained laboratory staff. And finally, sepsis biomarkers such as procalcitonin and presepsis are not sensitive enough for diagnosing viral infections. In the, last, in the last slide of this webinar, we have and suggested a tentative approach for the screening of patients with suspected sepsis, more deeply developing the concept formally anticipated, according to which concomitantly increased values of procalcitonin and presepsin would appear suggestive of bacterial sepsis, especially gram-negative bacterial sepsis, or mixed infections. Non-diagnostic values of both biomarkers may enable to safely rule out sepsis of both bacterial or fungal origin, while a disproportionate increase of presepsin combined with normal or only moderately elevated procalcitonin values would be suggestive for invasive fungal infection. Additional tests, such as those reported in this slide, can then be scheduled for achieving a more accurate etiological diagnosis later on. Obviously, this tentative approach needs large and robust validation in real life scenarios. Thank you all for your attention. Hi, Dirk. Dirk, are you there? 
Giuseppe, do you hear me? Oh, okay, perfect. Now I hear All you. Right. Perfect. Fine. Very well. So thank you once again for this outstanding talk, Giuseppe. Uh, Giuseppe. Thank you. From my point of view, you nicely summarized uh, the latest findings in this field. You presented the established biomarkers that we may use for the diagnosis of sepsis. So in particular, the uh, C-reactive protein and the ESR, the erythrocyte sedimentation rate. And you made clear that we have now new candidates like procalcitonin and presepsin. And they, as a matter of fact, have performed nicely and in particular in terms of procalcitonin there are um, very um, profound studies available which underline the importance of procalcitonin as a sepsis marker but there are shortcomings in terms of the viral sepsis of course. Uh, what is your view in uh, on the future is it only pcr that's going to help us well, uh, there are a lot of uh, a bunch of studies that have compared the diagnostic performance of uh, blood culture of PCR, meaning molecular biology in general, and serology. But combining all these techniques, uh, uh, you can never reach 100%. Uh, my impression, at least, uh, and my impression is more or less my experience uh, with viral sepsis in my hospital, is that molecular biology is really the most effective strategy for diagnosing sepsis because for instance uh, serology has the the main drawbacks of uh, uh, ambiental infection for instance you can be positive to herpes zoster virus because you have had an, another infection in another side of your body while uh, your blood may be negative for for the virus so uh, technically speaking i think that probably the only option that we have now is uh, molecular biology I am not aware whether in the future the panels will be broadened because the, the most important limitation I would say of molecular biology now is that they do not cover all the uh, potential viruses that are responsible for, uh, uh, for viral sepsis. So that is probably the, the main drawbacks. But I don't see, uh, as for now, any other reliable option. I see. Thank you so much for this uh, answer. We have the first uh, questions coming in here. Before I will turn to those questions, maybe I can put a second question to you. Um, yes. With regard to this discrimination of fungal sepsis, what you propose today is that um, you can use procalcitonin in presepsin. So you should have an increased presepsin concentration whereas the PCT elevated or normal. Is this exactly. really reliable to identify no, I mean, or to diagnose a fungal sepsis? Uh, this was proven in two, uh, only two clinical studies so far. So that's why I said at the end of the presentation that our algorithm need to be validated. This is just a proposal, but taking for granted what these two previous studies have published, uh, I would uh, I would be confident that in most uh, uh, patients with fungal sepsis, procalcitonin levels are not comparable to presepsin level. But the main shortcoming in the current scientific literature is that no single study has evaluated uh, procalcitonin and presepsin and even C-reactive protein, all the three of these biomarkers, for differentiating the three most important types of sepsis, meaning bacterial, fungal and viral sepsis. So we, we do really need a, a large multicenter study on this topic. All right, this was a clear answer. And um, now I can have here the first uh, question. It comes from Turkey and it is um, about PCT levels. So the question is PTs, PCT levels can increase with age. So is there a need for an additional cutoff uh, or are there cut-off values um, for elderly people in the literature? And, um, well, maybe I can extend this question. Uh, do we have to take into consideration the age of the patient when we measure PCT? Fortunately, not. Because the cut-off for diagnosing sepsis, uh, which is uh, variable between 0 0.5 and 2, Milligram, uh, two milligram per liter is actually very, very high compared to the physiological range. For instance, most of the patient, most of the elderly patient have values around 0 0.01, which is a 50 order of magnitude lower than the cutoff we are using for diagnosing sepsis. So 
aging is not is not a big issue and i would actually reply to the second answer because it's more or less similar to the to the former uh, and it's the same for for chronic chronic kidney disease because even with the uh, advanced stage of um, impaired renal function, the values never reach the cutoff that we are currently using for diagnosing sepsis. All right, so I think that was a clear answer. And uh, thank you very much for taking care of the second question here either. So the next question that we have, is there any indication in the emergency department? I missed this the next part. Um, well, I think it relates to CRP, to the use of CRP and procalcitonin. Right. Well, what we are currently doing and what we have recommended in our guidelines is that hopefully two biomarkers should be available to the emergency department. We have uh, concluded in our guidelines that so far or probably the most effective biomarkers are in fact C-reactive protein and procalcitonin, just for the reason that uh, there are many available studies on, uh, on these two biomarkers, while we are only now um, starting to accumulate data for Persepsin. Um, just to tell you, uh, Persep, the first uh, article on Persepsis for diagnosing sepsis was published in the 2011, which means that there are just eight years of uh, real clinical use of perceps in, in, uh, in uh, outside, I would say, the intensive care unit. So indeed, for now, if you don't, if you don't uh, have access to measuring perceptions, uh, the, the most reliable option is measuring CRP and procalcitonin combined. Well, very, um, thank you very much for this answer. Um, I have an additional question with regard to this particular one here. I mean, CRP as an established marker is um, yeah well is used by many scores risk scores for instance do you think that crp such as for instance uh, in uh, acute pancreatitis mm -hmm. severity prediction do you think that crp can be replaced by procalcitonin in the near future this is a fantastic question because there have been a lot of studies investigating procalcitonin in many, many, uh, I would say, uh, severe conditions like acute pancreatitis. And uh, uh, what the main outcomes of this study was that procalcitonin was a, a significant predictor of complication and especially of mortality. Now, uh, the only issue is that we don't know uh, right now whether the mortality was caused by a, a super infection. You, you, you know, of course, that uh, one of the main problems of acute pancreatitis, for example, is a superinfection. So we, we, don't, we cannot recognize so far whether the mortality is caused by the disease itself. And so procalcitonin would be an independent predictor of mortality in patients with pancreatitis, or whether the, the increment of procalcitonin actually reflects a superinfection bacterial, which then is responsible for the death of the patient. But, um, so far, procalcitonin is not included within the score for uh, evaluating this patient, but my uh, feeling is that sooner or later it will be ready for prime time, even in these conditions. So, in accordance with your opinion, it's just a matter of time and further Absolutely. I think okay. so. Very well. Then we have the next question here. And uh, what is diagnostic? What is the diagnostic accuracy of PCT in newborns and children. It's absolutely comparable to that in the adult population. The raw curves uh, are exactly the same. There have been three meta-analyses which have been published in the past five years, and they all confirm the same result as in the, in the adult population. The, the biggest advantage of uh, procalcitonin is that it's not exclusively synthesized by the liver. So when the neonates as frequently occurs as a liver failure, procalcitonin concentration is not is not influenced. So that's the biggest biggest advantage over other biomarkers. For well, um, I have an additional point which I would like to raise here. There was much hope in the past with regard to interleukin six, if I'm not mistaken. 
what is the reason that uh -huh. interleukin-6 is not used anymore at uh, or compared with PCT, for instance? Um, as far as I understand it, interleukin-6, uh, despite the fact that it is a very fast marker and it occurs very early after the onset of uh, a sepsis, you know, um, yes. the use of interleukin-6 today, from my point of view, is well, it's not as it was expected five years ago. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. And there are two main reasons for this. The first one is a clinical reason because the um, uh, specificity, the diagnostic specificity of interleukin-6 uh, is uh, much lower than the specificity of procalcitonin. And that's why the rock curves are always lower for interleukin-6 uh, uh, compared to, uh, for instance, to procalcitonin. The second issue, and this is why I uh, declined to introduce the measurement of EL6 uh, in my laboratory, is that because the pre-analytical management of EL6 is dramatically, dramatically severe. I mean, uh, uh, the sample must be shipped to the laboratory within 30 minutes because the molecule is very vulnerable, vulnerable to um, in vitro destruction within the blood tube by the leukocytes. So that's why we are not confident that uh, um, this measure is enough robust for routine diagnostics. It's a good research parameter, but not as good as for, for clinical practice, because uh, we, we all know that sometimes the samples arrive from the emergency department or from the intensive care unit after one or two hours, and that is not a good, uh, it is not acceptable for measuring interleukin-6. Well, uh... I understand that very well in terms of pre-analytics to, um, well, to have here just 30 minutes to get a sample to the laboratory. I think in reality, that uh, is, that is a challenge. Yes, so from that course. point of view, we have to put our hope um, into the new parameters like preception, right? Exactly. Okay, Giuseppe. There are no more questions here on the list. And to be honest, you know, I have no questions myself. I think uh, what I have to do now is once again to thank you for this outstanding talk. Uh, it was a very nice overview on the current uh, diagnostics of sepsis, you know. And you gave us a very elegant overview on the sepsis biomarkers that were that are available today and you had an outlook on the future. So from that point of view, the only thing that we can hope that there will be much more progress in this field. Um, we understood today from your talk that there are still uh, clinical needs to be addressed. We need new biomarkers. And from that point of view, any progress will be appreciated in this field. So um, sorry, there is another um, question that we have here on the board it, uh -huh. uh, is, it goes PCT is manufactured by only one company I think although there are uh, several um, other distributors and um, yeah. this company provide the, provides the kit to other <clears throat> diagnostic companies which um, yeah is this an advantage for PCT that there is only one company that probably holds the rights and uh, provides all the other companies with the, uh, let's say, main um, raw materials for the um, measurement of PCT? Uh -huh. um, so first of all, uh, there are now two companies. Uh, Brahms is not the, the only owner of the copyright because the, there is another company, another um, Japanese company, who has started to manufacture uh, procalcitonin kit. So we have two companies now, but I, I would absolutely agree with Dogan. Um, 98 and 99% of the market is covered by companies that are purchasing the uh, monoclonal antibodies from Brahms. So we uh, would expect that the standardization of procalcitonin measurement is fine, but we published two recent papers. One was a large multi-center studies we, we actually include more than eight different companies uh, 
with the same monoclonal antibodies, of course, on eight different platforms, and the bias was as high as 30% from uh, one company to the other, which means that regardless of the fact that the, theoretically uh, the manufacturer is, uh, is only one available on, on the vast majority of automated platforms, standardization is not uh, an issue that has been met so far. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. Before I again start closing this webinar, um, to everybody out there in the web world, is there another question that you would like to ask here? Please uh, do not be shy. Uh, Giuseppe is an excellent expert in the field and he will be more than happy to address your questions. So Giuseppe, maybe we we wait another 30 seconds and uh, once again, thank you so much for this uh, excellent overview. I think uh, maybe you can conclude your presentation once again in two sentences. I tried to do that, but uh, I'm not an expert in this field and that was just what I learned from your presentation. Maybe you can uh, highlight again the three main points with regard to sepsis biomarkers, current situation and outlook for the future. Sure. The first point is I, I would stress again the, the issue of the change of the, 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 I would call it a paradigm shift that has occurred in the definition of sepsis, because now sepsis is defined as the host response to the infection and not to the infection by itself. And if we understand, if you clearly understand that this is the new definition of sepsis, we also understand why uh, sepsis biomarkers will acquire uh, so much importance in the future. Because what we want to diagnose actually is the host response, and then we want to check whether this, uh, this host response is actually caused by a, a, a whatever type of infection. It can be fungal, it can be bacterial, it can be viral or whatsoever. So the, the, the first main issue is we have to be familiar with the definition. The second issue is the available biomarkers. So far, the most validated biomarkers are indeed, and those for, uh, for which the scientific literature seem more robust and more solid and more trustable are indeed uh, procacitonin and presepsin. And the third concept is that uh, these biomarkers and the results of these biomarkers, as well as any other laboratory test, must be interpreted according to the clinical setting. Because no single test can, can help the clinician make a diagnosis without a combination of clinical science, clinical history, clinical symptoms, and whatsoever. Thank you for this excellent summary. I think that was a nice end to this webinar. Thank you very much for anybody else uh, listening to this presentation, to this outstanding presentation of Giuseppe. And we are looking forward to the next webinar of the EFLM. Goodbye to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dirk, for the for chairing this section. You have been so kind. And I think we have to thank Daniel Rachel for of the course. Uh, technical support for the excellent control that he had here on this webinar. Thank you to you, Daniel, too. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Daniel.